suddenly in other areas, and spread like wildfire over the United States. Within 40 years, swine, and spreading consternation wherever it appeared. Vesicular exanthema, often nicknamed VE, is an infectious, contagious disease of swine caused by a filterable virus. Usually the first symptom observed by the hog raiser is lameness of the animals. Hogs develop blisters on the feet, causing them to limp painfully. Similar blisters or vesicles often appear in the snouts and sometimes on the tongues of the animals. These are the identical symptoms of the dreaded foot and mouth disease. They are also present in vesicular stomatitis and in vesicular exanthema. Since these diseases cannot be specifically identified by clinical observations and one may be masking or accompanying the other, it is imperative that the diagnosis of every vesicular infection be carefully established. Only scientific tests can tell these three diseases apart. When outbreaks occur and local veterinarians notify state and federal officials, the latter collect material from the sick hogs and with it inoculate a horse's tongue. This is part of field tests that play a large part in establishing a diagnosis. If the disease is vesicular stomatitis, the horse will develop lesions. If it is foot and mouth disease, no lesions will appear. If it is vesicular exanthema, such lesions will rarely develop. Inoculation of a cow's tongue will produce lesions if the disease is either foot and mouth or vesicular stomatitis. No reaction will result if it is VE. Injections into the muscles of another cow will bring lesions in the mouth if the infection is foot and mouth disease. None if it is vesicular stomatitis. Inoculated hogs will develop lesions if the disease is any one of the three vesicular types and vesicular stomatitis will produce lesions on all three animals. But if the infection is foot and mouth disease, only the cows and hog will develop lesions. State and federal officials work in close harmony to make these necessary and helpful tests and arrive at a diagnosis as soon as possible to determine which disease is present. When the 1952 outbreak of VE occurred, regulatory officials had the answers as to how it is introduced into herds and how it spreads. They obtained this information from experience with other exotic diseases and also from the history of vesicular exanthema in California. They had learned that scraps of meat from swine in the early stages of the disease thrown into raw garbage served as a means of transmitting infection. It has long been believed that this is the most common manner in which the disease kept alive. The spread of the disease, therefore, was attributed to the consumption by hogs of such raw garbage. And also by contact of healthy hogs with infected ones wherever swine were concentrated. They also knew that modern transportation methods were factors in spreading VE and other infectious diseases. For as man has increased his speed of transportation, he has also increased the rate at which disease can be spread. The task of controlling and eradicating such outbreaks is thus rendered more difficult. In the early days of the outbreak and rapid spread of vesicular exanthema, as the newspapers told the story of its appearance in various states, disposal of infected swine as part of control programs was slowed up due to lack of funds for payment of indemnities. More and more swine became infected as the disease continued to spread. Scarce markets were developing and many stockyard pens were empty. Swine raisers were reluctant to ship to market fearing quarantine. Meanwhile, VE was moving across the nation like a forest fire, appearing in a majority of the states throughout the country. But state regulatory officials were on the move to control the outbreak and were informing the industry of the danger of living with such a disease. Those who had experience in the control of vesicular exanthema were emphatic in urging that all raw garbage fed to swine be cooked. 
This disease cannot be eradicated unless all garbage is cooked. All garbage fed to swine must be cooked. There's only one solution. Cook it. Livestock men, associations, and citizens began calling the attention of their state legislatures to the need for regulations governing the use of raw garbage. To meet the emergency and decide what action to take, leading livestock men and state agricultural officials met with federal officials in Washington, D.C. at the United States Department of Agriculture. Here, the problems of VE were discussed at length and decisions made on a program of control and eradication. Upon the request of state officials and members of the livestock industry, the Secretary of Agriculture declared an emergency, which he said threatened the livestock industry of the country. That this makes it possible for the United States Department of Agriculture to enter into a cooperative eradication program to be conducted in the affected states, whereby the federal government will assist these states in the payment of indemnity. The payment of Cooperative eradication programs were developed between the states and the federal government. These included inspection, quarantine, disposal of infected swine, cleaning and disinfection, control over the movement of garbage-fed swine, and action by states to pass garbage feeding regulations prohibiting the feeding of raw garbage. Studies were conducted at the Agricultural Research Center in Deltsville, Maryland, that reconfirmed the belief that infected pork scraps, if fed to swine, could reproduce the disease. Since raw garbage had been established as a source of infection, control of its use became imperative. This function rested with the individual states. State legislators were urged by their constituents to take immediate action and pass proper regulations to ensure the cooking of all garbage fed to swine at a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 30 minutes. This treatment was known to kill the virus and render garbage safe for hog feed. The states began enacting legislation requiring garbage cooking and feeders started using various devices to handle the job. One type was a small, inexpensive, homemade affair, consisting of a container under which an open fire was built. These models were adequate, providing time and temperature requirements were met. Other feeders, requiring a larger capacity, designed cookers that were efficient, economical, and simple to operate. Some used fuel oil fed through blowers to furnish an intense heat. A motor-operated agitator kept the stew in motion. A simple means of removing the garbage and carting it to feeding floors proved important, particularly if one man could handle the complete processing. Large feeders required a method of cooking large amounts of garbage quickly and with a minimum of handling. Some designed deep tank cookers operated by steam and mounted against embankments so trucks could drive up and empty their loads into them from above. The cooked garbage is removed into other trucks for transporting to the feeding pens. The heat retained in large quantities of freshly cooked garbage requires many hours to cool before it can be fed to hogs. Another method regarded as one of the best is to cook the garbage right in the transporting trucks. These are fitted with racks of perforated pipes around the bottom of the loading area. Live steam passed into the pipes rises through the garbage to do a thorough job. It takes only a moment to fasten the connection, turn on the steam, and start the processing. One feeder uses an old sawmill boiler, which burns a low-grade fuel oil, to obtain an abundance of steam. Before long, a high percentage of states passed laws or regulations governing garbage feeding, an important step in the right direction. The danger existed, and always will, that until all garbage is properly cooked prior to feeding to swine, complete eradication cannot be accomplished. Technical advice is needed by raw garbage feeders on how to build, maintain, and operate economically the proper equipment necessary to cook the quantities of garbage they use. 
Such help is freely given by state and federal regulatory officials. Reports from a high percentage of the feeders who are now cooking garbage have been favorable. I'm well pleased with results. Since I've been cooking, I've had less loss, better growth. It's a paying proposition. I can raise more swine on the same amount of feed. My hogs seem to like it better. Progress was being made. Some states instituted a system of licensing those who feed cooked garbage. Feeders of uncooked garbage can move their swine only to restricted areas under a special permit. Frequent periods of inspection of equipment and of the swine on feeder farms are carried out in many states. Transportation conveyances and facilities are also disinfected. Stockyards and concentration points are doing their best to cooperate by cleaning and disinfecting pens as a precautionary measure. And are making efforts to prevent infected and raw garbage fed hogs from entering their yards. Observations have shown that grain-fed hogs rarely contract VE since they are not exposed to infected meat scraps in their food. Those that become infected, the records show, usually do so through contact with raw garbage-fed animals. Hogs can be infected and act as carriers before symptoms appear as long as six days. That is why the disease can spread so rapidly. For example, a carload of apparently healthy garbage-fed hogs is shipped to market. Actually, they are infected with VE. Healthy grain-fed hogs from another area are also going to market. They join at concentration points or stockyards. Here, however, the mixing of the shipments permits the garbage-fed VE-infected hogs to lose their identity as such. So by the time the shipment reaches its destination, the disease has broken out and the previously healthy grain-fed hogs are now infected. It is practically impossible to sort the grain-fed from the garbage-fed hogs and impracticable for stockyards and other concentration points to keep them separated. That's why the program to control and eradicate VE has to start with the garbage-fed hogs before they go to market. The cooking of garbage is also an important aid in helping to prevent the deliberate attempt by an enemy to reduce America's food supply by introducing a dangerous foreign animal disease into the livestock population through raw garbage. It is significant that the last two outbreaks of foot and mouth disease in this country were traced directly to swine that had been fed raw garbage. Hog cholera can be spread by such garbage. Direct losses from this disease have amounted to $65 million in a single year. The feeding of untreated garbage is also a means of spreading tuberculosis in swine, swine erysipelas, vesicular stomatitis, and trichinosis, a feared human disease against which the United States Public Health Service has led a continuing fight. One authority reports his findings that the organism is found much more frequently in garbage-fed swine than in grain-fed hogs. Proper treating of garbage kills these parasites, as well as other bacteria and viruses, including those that cause that respiratory nervous disorder of poultry called Newcastle disease. It broke out and since then has spread to all 48 states, causing mortality losses up to 60% in affected flocks. The garbage feeding industry plays a definite part in the pork production of our country. It converts a waste product into a usable one. Regulatory officials and those in the livestock industry want to aid these feeders to stay in business, not hinder them, as long as their feeding practice does not endanger the livestock industry of the nation. Hog raisers are urged to report immediately any diseases in their herds to their local veterinarian or to the state veterinarian, so that if infectious, these diseases can be checked and brought under control before they spread. The state veterinarian will notify regulatory officials in the United States Department of Agriculture. Thus, all who are responsible for safeguarding our livestock 
can have full knowledge of the situation.